host Sarvim Bharatiya reporting for TFI, a platform where we talk about open source emerging technologies. Today we are going to talk to Thomas Giacomo, or as he is famously known with his Suze as Dr. T. Dr. T is CTO of Suze and we are going to talk about the role of CTO at an engineering company like Suze. Uh, what is it planning for future because as a CTO, uh, he's, 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 he's into things that are coming up in future, not the things that happen in past. So we're going to talk about all those, you know, latest technologies and everything else that Suze is planning. Uh, so let's let's go and meet Dr. T. So, so the first question is uh, that, uh, what is the role of CTO of a company like uh, Suze? So the main role is to spend time with our key partners and customers, understanding their needs and also explaining them what SUSE is doing, but also doing the same with the open source communities, scooting some of the industry trends, and then bring back, bring back that home to discuss with our marketing, alliance people, engineering, uh, about what could be the next step for SUSE um, in terms of adding those new technologies in our portfolio or working with partners to deliver them. And, uh, Actually, I'm happy to announce that uh, at SUSECON, we are launching a CTO office at SUSE because we keep on growing, we're investing more and more into people, into projects, and so we are creating a CTO office uh, now. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that you know, CTO office, you will be the heading of CTO office. So what would be the kind of key uh, you know, people who will join the CTO office and what will be their roles then? So I think the... There are a couple of different angles to that. One is to work even more with the open source communities and projects. We do a lot today, uh, but we want to engage even more with that. Another one is to be maybe localized in some key territories like North and South America or Asia PAC. Uh, because I'm based in Europe and CTO to meet chief travel officer, I've been traveling all around the world and it doesn't scale. So at some point we also need people to be in, in the specific places where we have partners, where we have key customers, and as it's everywhere, then uh, we need those guys to be to be to be there. Then, of course, we have different focuses in the company. So we focus on software-defined infrastructure type of technologies, from storage um, to, to OpenStack, including virtualization and all of that, containers, application delivery. So, in the team, we would have expertise across all those technologies, with some people deeply more involved with specific. Uh, topics like more on the application side or more on the storage side, for instance, or cloud. Uh, and as a CTO, you know, uh, when we look at the whole technology stack in modern world, you know, first of all, we are in the kind of uh, in the middle of a revolution that's going on. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the the technology is moving really fast, you know. And on top of you know the technology that was announced last year, a lot of iterations are happening, you know, on top of that. Uh, and uh, so, uh, first of all, from your perspective as a CTO. What are the really you know, exciting and hot technologies, of course, for enterprise? Yeah. And um, um, how do you see SUSE should be, what are the technologies you think SUSE should be investing in, uh, which are like forward-looking technologies? Okay, so I, I think that there's still a lot of growth and a lot of uh, adoption around software defined storage, for instance, that needs to happen and that's happening. So if you take Ceph, for instance, all the, the, the improvements on performances that are achieved in the last release upstream is going to help a lot enterprise customers to adopt software defined storage for even more use cases than they do today. So same thing with OpenStack. OpenStack keeps on being um, adopted. We keep on seeing new innovation and things that make things easier for people to use in production, address more use cases. So there are a lot of things around software defined infrastructure that can help even more our customers today. Now, those things have to be managed as well. So. We need to make sure that we provide management solutions together with our partners or by SUSE ourselves to help our customers uh, benefiting from, from what they could put in place. And the last thing that I, mentioned, that, I would like, that I would like to mention is the application side of things. So SUSE is an infrastructure company. It's been the case for the 20 last five years and, uh, and we are still focusing on software defined infrastructure. But it's very important that we Keep in mind that at the end of the day, the infrastructure is used by applications, and that's where our customers are making their business or are depending their business on. So more and more, we are including technologies to facilitate the development of, of applications, deployment, development, maintenance of applications with technologies like containers. So we announced SUSE Containers, the service platform version 2 here at SUSECON. 
uh, with the latest Kubernetes and a lot of more other things. And also even more towards developers themselves, technologies like Cloud Foundry um, that can help a lot developers speeding up their, their, their work and uh, benefiting to the, to, to the business. And so for us, it's very important to bridge those two worlds together. So it's not like you work on the software defined infrastructure and then you work on the application delivery. If they don't talk to each other, then you don't really benefit from your infrastructure and from the whole solutions that you can get today. Uh, I understand, you know, that Suze is a you know, infrastructure company and when I think about exciting technologies, I always look at machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I, I am very well aware, you know, that that's not the market where Suze will go, you know, Suze is not going to invest in TensorFlow and all those machine learning technologies. But how can machine learning help, you know, the, the stack of infrastructure itself, you know, how can you use machine learning technologies? Mm -hmm. I mean, automation is the key today, you know, but machine learning can take it to the next table. Yeah. So, so what, what do you, what's your, you know, kind of perspective on that? So that, that's a very, very interesting question. So you're right, we don't have a TensorFlow based product today, for instance, but we are working on integrating TensorFlow with some of the SUSE technologies. Well, first, because it's fun. So our engineers are doing that uh, because they like it. Also because some of our partners and customers are looking to integrate uh, machine learning into their own solutions that are running on SLES or SUSE OpenStack or SUSE containers. And I'm thinking partners like SAP, HPE, they all have interest in those technologies and we are working with them to see how we can interface all of that. And as you mentioned, I think there's, there are concrete use cases <coughs> to improve software defined infrastructure with machine learning. So we actually have some proof of concept internally to filter the bug request and the support request that we have, use machine learning to predict what's going to come. Or um, another use case is that we are using that to check how much time it takes to deploy packages to let's say thousands of servers so that we can predict next time the maintenance window or how much time it will take in a, a different environment. So we are also looking at machine learning to help operations uh, inside our products. And um, another example that I could give is uh, if you take software defined storage or even CASP, it's distributed systems with clusters and uh, it can be quite complex to set up a Ceph for your own use case based on your hardware, what you want to do with the data and all of that. And sometimes as humans, we try to configure things, but it's not perfect. And we think that machine learning could help as well. So having many, many customers using that technology getting all the data on how it's configured, how it's performing, then machine learning could help us to create configurations that are more optimized automatically for other um, setups. So yeah, we're looking into that. Last point maybe, um, and it's probably more linked to uh, high performance computing where machine learning can be used as well. We are working more and more with the NVIDIA CUDA drivers, for instance, to also implement, let's say, the, the processing part of it. Uh, in relationship with the hardware. Right. Uh, now let's change the topic from future to somewhat past. <coughs> uh, this is kind of complicated and sensitive topic, Cloud Foundry. Mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry came before Docker made containers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> sorry, popular. Uh, basically, if you look at it, it seems like, you know, the Cloud Foundry was trying to solve the same problem, you know, to extract the whole layer and you just worry about your application. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of Docker also does. You know, you just you know, worry about deploying your application at a scale. Now, Suze has, of course, you have RHEL, and then you also have CASP, and yeah. you're also closely working with the uh, Cloud Foundry, and you also have OpenStack. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, you know that uh, three of these things, you know, try to do the solve the same problem. Yeah. At the same time, you know, they also kind of compete with each other. So. From your perspective, perspective, do you see some kind of consolidation in future, or where do you see this IES pass and CASP world, you know, either uh, colliding with each other or coexisting? Can you please talk yeah, about that? Sure. So, now looking at some of the problems are, are the same, uh, but they don't look it from the same angle. So, let's let's start with containers and, and Cloud Foundry, for instance. So, Cloud Foundry is more looking at helping developers to develop. Uh, of course, with all the CI, CD, and DevOps things to, to get the applications in production, but by providing build packs of programming languages, prepackaged libraries, services that you can consume, and they do that a lot better than what a container infrastructure could do. 
containers are providing more the delivery mechanism um, for, for, for putting things that are running in containers in production. So to me, it's like you, you use a pass to build services. The services are running inside containers and you use gas to manage all those containers, schedule them. And of course, it's not that black and white, right? So they, as you mentioned, I don't see them colliding. I, today, I see them as complementary, but they will converge. And that's why uh, through the Cloud Foundry based solution is actually containers that are managed by Kubernetes so that we try not to silo them separate from each other but to have them work together inside each other so that you can benefit from the, the best things from both worlds. So that's for container, that CAS and PASS. If you look at OpenStack, um, containers today, they run in production. A lot of companies are running them in productions. But quite frequently, they run inside VMs. Or they run, and, and VMs can be managed by OpenStack or by other solutions or whatever. And the reason is that a VM, a VM environment is still better at managing the storage and the networking and the underlying layers that containers cannot really do today. And there are a lot of works being done to improve how storage uh, is, is interfaced with containers or networking, but today, Yes, it's still a better way to manage your private data in infrastructure <coughs> from networking and storage, for instance, than containers. So typically, you could have an OpenStack with containers managing the, the, the workloads, but OpenStack taking care of networking with, with, with the open daylight, for instance, storage with Ceph, and then you would have the pass layer on top of it for the developers themselves. Now, the, they are complementary, but you need to make sure that they work well together as well. And uh, that's also what we are trying to bring with the SUSE solutions, actually, some integration with, uh, between those, those different projects. So, so if we just look at the analogy of you know, the lab stack in old days, you know, yeah. so if you look at the modern, you know, uh, infrastructure, what stack would you call it? Because you have, you know, yeah. open stack for that manager cloud foundry, and then you have containers. Yeah. So, so from uh, SUSE's perspective, and the good thing is you have all four, you know, that's... So Linux could be open stack. Some people have said that OpenStack was the operating system of private cloud, for instance. And, uh, and we should probably talk about hybrid cloud as well, because it's not only about private. But right. let's say OpenStack is the L. Uh, Apache would be maybe uh, pass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's getting tricky, right? No, no let's not like yeah. the, by, in a point by point, but like just like yeah. four components, you know, which do different things. Like Kubernetes is like orchestration that for every where, you know, so there are yeah. different you know, components of the stack yeah. that serve different purposes. So there is no collision as yeah, such. Right. Yeah. So I think to me, the past layer is the layer talking directly with developers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kubernetes layer is orchestrating. So the containers are the core of all of that, right? Because they are common to infrastructure and developers. Uh, so developers, they use PaaS to develop. Containers are built with the container infrastructure, managed with the container infrastructure, deployed, upgraded, and all of that. And then the data center infrastructure is managed with a YAS solution, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does make sense. Uh, one last question before we wrap it up would be that uh, uh, what, are the, what are the areas that you think, I mean, uh, we already talked about, you, know, you have Stopwood stack, you have the CASP, you have open source yeah. CASP as a cubic for community, then uh, a lot of other things. So uh, what are the new areas that you think SUSE should be or is going to invest on where you see a lot of excitement happening? So, and, and there's still some new stuff to be done for the, the, the software-defined storage and, and stuff like that. I think software-defined networking um, so is, is, is a topic where things could be better. And uh, there are a lot of solutions, but it's very fragmented, and the use cases are very different between telcos and IT. So there are still a lot of things that could be improved, and not only from a SUSE perspective, but from an industry and an open source community perspective as well. Mm -hmm. And we're working with the Linux Foundation on that, together with other companies. Another key aspect to me is the management of all of this, because you have management and orchestration for OpenStack, you have that for containers, you have that for PaaS, you have that for storage. <clears throat> but as an operator or service provider, I don't want to have a different dashboard, different uh, management solution for all the different pieces of that stack. I need something that is integrated and unified. So that's also one thing that I think could help. So typically, we are providing SUSE Cloud Application Platform, a Cloud Foundry-based solution, and SUSE Container as a Service Platform. 
some customers, they don't want to have a Kubernetes dashboard and management system and a cloud foundry, they want to have something that is integrated for them to use, like a platform management tool. So that's one where space where we will continue to work. We do that with OpenATIC for storage and to the manager, and we'll keep on working on that. <coughs> and maybe the last thing I, I would mention <coughs> related to application delivery. Um, I think the industry still needs to work on improving the way that services are consumed. So you have di different service catalogs or service platforms that are not interoperable. And so we need to make sure that we can provide to developers who are using any type of platforms the uh, access to services from public clouds, from what they have internally, from what they have from partners, or even from competition, so that they can build applications together. And then once it's done with all those different services, make sure that those services can talk to each other with service meshing um, and configuring those services the, from the networking to the role-based access at the service level that they need for applications. Uh, uh, there's always one last question. Yeah. Since you're mentioning that you know, the, one of the areas is you know, kind of management or, or orchestration, when we look at Kubernetes, it's like going everywhere. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, uh, you said that you know, some of your customers don't want Kubernetes, but do you think that the SUSE solution, which will work across the board, will be somehow based on, because somehow Kubernetes is kind of becoming Linux kernel of the... Yeah, so it, for, for the container management and orchestration, I can say yes. Mm -hmm. uh, today, so I don't have a crystal ball for like two or three years from now, but definitely yes. Uh, I was thinking about also the management from a user interface perspective and, and the single dashboards, and mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be Kubernetes or, mm -hmm. or something else, right? Uh, and the same applies to monitoring and logging. So people, they don't want to have to look at the logs of Kubernetes when they run something else on top or with it. They want to look at consolidated logs of all the platform and stack. Uh, some of them, some of them I still want to look at the separate pieces together. But uh, so I think we are, today Kubernetes is clearly uh, the solution that we select for container management and orchestration. And uh, we're hoping to complement that with other, other solutions too, as we do with Cloud Foundry. I think we got everything that we were looking for today. Yeah. yeah. So thanks once again for your time. Yeah, it was nice you. talking to you and hope to meet you again soon. Yeah, exactly. thank you, sir. Thank you. And back to our audience, thanks for listening. We love talking to technologists and business leaders. So if you want us to talk to technologists and business leaders of your company, get in touch with us. You can find all the links in the tfir.io slash about page. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Here's the link. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye for now.